you had done a keynote previously about how do physicians who are maybe students or not at those leadership roles, how do they exert influence? How do they lead when they are not in a formal leadership role? So can you share some insights around that? And I'm also curious to hear your take on, you know, in the medical field, it's very hierarchical. As you go through school, especially as a student and then moving up into residency, higher positions, even nurses to doctors and other staff, sometimes it is quite hierarchical and you see behaviors and sometimes as you climb the ranks, then you emulate some of those same behaviors. So how do you learn what is good when it comes to being a leader? You know, what are some of those behaviors that I should take on versus behaviors that are actually not serving me or my team? Great question. A few things. And I think you're referring to a talk that I gave to students at Nassim, Northern Ontario School of Medicine. Mm -hmm. So as physicians, as students and, and as physicians, I mean, we can always advocate for our patients and making sure that they get the best care that they need. And we can be voice advocates speaking out on a cause that's of interest to us, whether it's climate change and the effect of health or whether it's sustainability of the healthcare system. There are things that we can do to add our voice and more opportunities for us to do that by being part of organizations, advocacy organizations. There are ways in which we can contribute to the knowledge and do what I call knowledge advocacy, whether fortunate to have research positions or opportunities to generate other opportunities to generate new knowledge and light the ad that shed light on that we're concerned about. And that's another way in which we can be an effective advocate. But there's also within organizations, the day-to-day -day advocacy upwards. And some people call this probably managing up. And I think regardless of what your job title, whether it seems like you're on paper, you're relatively low on the org chart or, or much higher, or even at the top, there's always other groups or individual stakeholders or other bodies to which you are accountable to. And there are always situations where there's a particular issue that you don't think is being addressed that needs to be addressed or a way of doing things that isn't quite right. And that's a real skill. That is kind of leadership skill that all of us, regardless of what our official title is, can, can develop. It's having the courage and assertiveness to raise an issue, the diplomacy intact to not cause that person offense or defensiveness when they do that, that you're challenging their authority or making them feel incompetent. It's the technique of phrasing things as a question rather than a, you must do this. And if you're not, that usually doesn't go well <laughs> in most, <laughs> but raising it as a question, you know, ah, observing this, what's going, you know, what do you think? Are we doing this? And sometimes not questioning the actual action, but often things like just saying, we got to, I'm not sure whose role or responsibility this is, clarifying roles and responsibilities and things like that can often improve the function and also provide better room for you to put forward the things that are within your responsibility. So those are all kind of different things that we can all be doing regardless of our position in order to move an organization or move our society in a particular direction that we think would be better. And do you think as a physician, this is often a critique we hear as physician or as clinical leaders, you're sort of just promoted into leadership roles, right? So you're not given that formal leadership education or training. So what can we do? What needs to be done or thinking about the future, thinking about our future leaders and our healthcare system? Number one, when you're in that first, don't panic. <laughs> <laughs> Easier said than done, by the way. Secondly, be aware of what your weakness is that, you know, actually nobody ever taught me how to manage people. Be aware of that. Don't assume that this is something that's innate. These are all, I think these are all learned and learnable skills. Three, figure out where you're gonna learn that. So what courses, what programs, what mentors, what key individuals are gonna allow you the opportunity or give you venues where you can be taught those different types of skills. And perhaps there's some way that you can get some kind of metric on how you're progressing in terms of your ability to manage that. That would be helpful. And sometimes it's just informal feedback from your colleagues checking, in, hey, you know, how, how am I doing? I mean, how's my leadership style going over? Trying to collect that data is very important to get feedback on what you're doing well. Right. Great tips. Yeah, it's so important to get feedback, right? Because leadership okay. is, you know, sometimes we think we're doing the right thing, but the perception on the outside is sometimes totally different. But feedback is so important. Yeah. And a really important point, even if you as a leader want the feedback, you recognize that often employees can be really afraid mm -hmm. and are not sure what the environment is. Well, if I tell my feedback, mm -hmm. they don't like, oh, that's, mm -hmm. you know, one ding against my relationship with my superior. 
And, but without it, you're managing in the dark often. So you a way to create an environment where people can give that feedback. And sometimes set some rules. If you get feedback, it's got to be done in a certain way and not a way uh -huh. that's snarky or makes you makes other people in a very accusatory or nasty way. You can set you can set rules in which to give that feedback, and then people know, okay, these are the boundaries I need to stay in, in order to get my point across. You mentioned you were the inaugural CEO for the Health Quality Council of Saskatchewan and then for Ontario. What would you say is required to be successful in those kinds of roles where you are new, the organization is new, especially think about the OHTs now. What is required to make sure that you and your team are both successful at the endeavor? Well, I think now there's something that I read in one of my leadership readings was that organizations have a tendency to find people that are really, really technically good in a particular area and immediately put them into a leadership position. But then to be actually to lead people, teams, organizations, it's almost like a totally different field of competency. And so at the start of my journey, I think I fell into, I was kind of like bring that a typical, pretty stereotypical example. And what I learned a very, what I had to learn very quickly is in that position, you may have great technical expertise, but what really matters is your management of the relationships, your internal relationships, your external relationships with the different stakeholders, with the government, other organizations, and internally for people that are that you're reporting to, like the board, as well as the people that within your the strong people with technical skills. Internally making sure that there's a desirable and happy and productive environment in which they can their skills can flourish and externally making sure that people, a level of trust in what you have to offer and that you're not just barging in there with a lot of these thinking you know everything, but rather building knowledge and expertise together to move forward. So I think that was the number one, the number one thing that I had to learn in my leadership journey. And that would be, I think that's, that would be a universal principle for any leader embarking in whether it's the, the health teams or other organizations managing those people, though they matter. They matter to what you want to accomplish and to getting things done and manage that well.